Look at that, Nate changing hearts and minds. I'm not sure how, <laughs> but it looks like Nate is changing some hearts and minds. Oh, it's close. Oh, it's close. Now, I do have to factor in that a few people are missing, so I'll probably wait on this one. You may continue to dispute it in the chat. I just I didn't want to spend more than 15 minutes on that. I actually uh, hoped, I thought there would be two others, so sorry. That was kind of a waste of time there. I thought we'd have a little bit more back and forth. And uh, I guess we spent 10 minutes debating the merits of debating it. Yeah, obviously, if the class was to vote a different way than I've scored it so far, I would I would update it. So what you see there isn't necessarily your final score. But in the absence of that, we'll just continue talking about real-time networking. And I'm going to see where we left off. I don't quite remember. I think we left off uh, somewhere along trying to optimize it here. Yeah, right, right around there somewhere. Yep, right here is where we left off, the last part of keyframes. So when we were last talking about this, it was not your homework yet. Just waiting for everybody else to stream in since I just posted the link to Discord now. So don't worry if you are just joining us, you have not missed anything. And if you're wondering why we started late today, we were adjudicating what I thought were going to be a few disputes about the Red Blue Challenge on Monday, but it ended up being that everybody withdrew their contest except the one that we already uh, solved. Okay, but we did have an updated Wireshark link there for Nate's dispute. And there is a poll up on whether or not you agree with the updated information. So when we left off on talking about how to compress the size of the keyframe, or the key. We were talking about that last week. And when we left off on it, I had not yet put up the homework, and now I have, so now it's a little bit more relevant to you. I will say that I'm not 100% sure that the requirements for the homework are mm, fair, let's say, so I might raise them. All right, if, I, if you're having trouble getting it down to, I said 3,000 bytes, if that ends up being really difficult, let me know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider just raising the requirement. So I'll make this announcement again in a few minutes. Remind me if I don't. Um, but the homework requires you to compress what I sent. So remember, if we were looking at the Eclipse version, let me open it up as well, actually. My version of the homework that does accomplish the bonus technically it serializes that entire 2D array of colors and sends that serialized version and we looked at it in Wireshark it's like a bunch of cues um, when you see it in its byte form right and it's also we saw it comes over many many segments I actually went ahead and tested it in Java to see exactly how long it was and I can confirm that it is roughly 13,000 bytes it's actually really hard to find the exact number of bytes that a serialized object has in Java, but you can get a really good estimate. So it's about 13,000 and some change bytes, um, I believe. So that lines up with what we saw in Wireshark. So that's obviously very ineffective. We're looking at like, uh, again, from Wireshark, it came out over something like six to eight segments, if I remember correctly. And so your job for the homework is to compress it down to less than 3,000 bytes. All right, and when we were looking at keys last time, I was talking about how we might compress color grid down. I talked about how we could use just three bytes for every tile by specifying red, green, and blue. 
And if we had 2,500 such messages in order, that would completely spell out the all the colors of that 50 by 50 grid. Okay, and then I said, well, all right, we can reduce it even further by having the color as the first three bytes and then two bytes for how many times that repeats. So if the whole screen was white, we would send 255, 255, 255, and then 2500 to indicate that all of the next 2500 cells are white, and that would be a savings of some 7,495 bytes, remember. Now, for the homework right now, uh, again, I'm repeating it, the requirement is to compress it to 3,000 bytes or less. If this is too difficult, let me know, and I will drop the requirement if enough people complain. I think it's feasible, like, um, in terms of something you could come up with, because I think I've already given you something, hint, hint, that pretty much does that. But if you're having a lot of trouble implementing it, I might drop that a bit. If, if people can come up with something simpler that does the job, uh, maybe 5,000 is fair as well. All right, so yeah, your homework is to basically compress the currently slightly more than 13,000 byte keyframe into 3,000 bytes or less, which is a massive savings in terms of the number of segments that need to cross the network. That means you're drastically reducing the bandwidth consumption. You're also reducing probably latency. You're reducing um, the requirement on the buffer uh, because you're also reducing the bandwidth, so obviously you're reducing the requirement on the buffer. And that means that the server can probably support more connections. So as we saw when we tried it out in class, once something like 10 people connect, it starts to get pretty slow. And if we manage to uh, reduce the size of the keyframe, I think we'll be able to see uh, with a 3,000 byte keyframe, even keeping the tick rate the same as it is now, which is really aggressive, I think we've got it at 32 times a second. So even at 32 times a second, I speculate we'll be able to support all 20 or so of you. I think there's something like 20, 20 something, low 20s people in the class. So I speculate we'll be able to support all you guys if we can get the keyframe below 3,000 bytes. All right, that brings us to our next topic, which is the bonus on that assignment. Should have just hit Shift F5. All right. That brings us to the next topic, which is the bonus, which is deltas. All right. So when you are transmitting video content and such, and make no mistake, what we're doing for the homework is the same thing as transmitting video. And this is also used very often in games and other things, but video is the big one that really um, drives this technology, the, the invention of the, the delta or the diff system. When you're sending video, it's not possible to send everything as keyframes. It's also not possible with video to save everything as keyframes. A video saved in purely keyframes would be like a terabyte for like a little short, uh, maybe hour-long video or something. You know, it's it would be massive. So we have to do well, this diff system in order to compress it. Now, uh, pretty much every existing video codec implements some kind of diff system. So you might say, well, if I want to implement deltas for my homework, I'll go look up how the existing codecs do it. And that'd be fine, but the math behind them, the way that they do it is really, really complicated. So I would encourage you to try to write your own uh, simpler kind of diff system. You can get a pretty decent performance uh, for not too much effort, whereas the existing algorithms, the ones that are actually in use, are based on really complicated math, things like Markov chains and stuff like that. Um, and obviously they're much more effective than the simple stuff, but they're a little bit too difficult to wrap your head around, right? So a delta is simply the difference since the last key. So sometimes people call this a diff instead of a delta, and you'll often see a keyframe and then delta frame. So the keyframes in video are usually called like iframes, and then everything else is a delta or a delta frame. And we do this because obviously sending the entire state is really expensive. Somebody asked, is this the same concept for delta backups? Yes, it is. Delta backups and delta change logs and things like that. So a delta backup is also a very effective way to save space and bandwidth. If you have a file that's, let's say, 100 gigs, 
Um, let's just say it's a text file for purposes of argument. We probably wouldn't have a 100 gig text file, right? And you change one letter. Okay, do you want to update your whole 100 gigs of backup? Of course not. So you make a delta. So you have your, your original file, and then there's a delta that just says this one character was changed. Okay, if you want to restore the original file, you look at that 100 gig original, and then at the deltas, that brings you to the original file without having to re-upload that whole 100 gig file. And that's essentially the same thing that we're doing here. We're saying, this has been the change since the last keyframe. That way I don't have to send you the entire state again. I just have to send you the change in the state since the last time that you were updated. So a simple delta example here, let's say that we want to transmit these four numbers here. And we'll notice that these numbers are big enough that they don't fit cleanly into two bytes. The most you can put into two bytes is 65,000 and change, right? Two to the 16th. So these would take at least three bytes. Now, um, you could just use like a part of a byte, but remember, we try not to do that because it's usually too much headache. Um, that's an optimization you really don't want to make unless you absolutely have to. So. These take uh, four times the three bytes each, that's 12 bytes to send these, if, if each of these were a key, right? So if instead we send key plus delta, then we send the first number as our key, and then we send a 1, a 110, and a negative 220. Why a 1, a 110, and a negative 220? Well, to get the second number from the first, what do you do? You add 1. Right? And then to get the third number from the second, what do you do? You subtract 100. And then to get the fourth number from the third, what do you do? You subtract 220. Now, all of these could be packed into one byte, potentially. Uh, notice that with the negative 220, it's a little bit iffy, right? Because how do we get the negative packed into a single byte when we can only fit 0 to 255? But, you know... We'll just put that problem aside and say that they're all packed into one byte. That means that we've saved six bytes total in transit because we would have needed uh, three bytes each to send those things. Instead, we're sending a three-byte message, then a one, then a one, and then another one, which brings us only to six instead of 12. So we've actually halved the bandwidth consumption in this very simple example by sending just the change since the key instead of having each number be its own key. And you can see that this can add up pretty quickly if you have, um, let's say, instead of a number this small, you had a number that took up many, many, many bytes, which is essentially what bytes are, right? I mean, all we're sending is, is zeros and ones. So if you have um, a state that is, let's say, 100 bytes long and only uh, the, the number is only changing by some mathematical value, and that mathematical value is fairly small, uh, we can send those as deltas very easily as well. How does that apply to something like color grid? Let's think about that as I continue here. So keys in the key and delta implementation that is commonly used will sync clients. So you might ask, why send keys at all after the beginning? So why don't we just send one key at the start and then send everything else as a delta? That'd be the ultimate in bandwidth savings. And there are systems that do this, that send just the key at the beginning, and then they only send deltas. But the reality is the traffic gets lost, and it arrives out of order sometimes, and system clocks aren't perfectly synced with each other, so sometimes your timer isn't the same as their timer, which means that you might apply your delta slightly differently, and that might happen that might be significant. Obviously, if your messages arrived out of order here, so if in this previous example you got the 110 before the 1 on the receiving end, and there wasn't a mechanism like TCP's segment numbers for it to be reordered, well then your values would be completely different. If you got the 110 before the 1, and you didn't know to reorder them, which again you would with TCP, then instead of 11... Uh, 454, you would add 110 to this, you would get 11, uh, 5, 5, 5, 6, 3, 11, 5, 6, 3, right? Which is not any of the numbers that we wanted to send. And then you would get the 1 next, so that'd be 11, 5, 6, 4, which is correct because addition there is cumulative, right? And then the third number you would still have correct, but you would have gotten the second number wrong. Okay, so it wouldn't corrupt all the data to get it out of order, and you could recover as long as you got them all in this simple example, but you would have uh, some corruption. So anyway, most systems that implement deltas will still send keys periodically in order to get synchronization. Another big disadvantage of not sending the keys 
uh, periodically, is that if you wanted to, let's say it's a video and you only send a key at the beginning and then the next uh, rest of the content is in delta. So let's say that somebody's 30 minutes into the video and they rewind a bit, right? How do you rewind in the delta system? You have to subtract all the deltas up to that point, or I mean, what do you do? It's really complicated. So video uses keyframes for this kind of synchronization. You can actually only fast forward and move ahead. Remember, I talked about this when we were discussing keyframes. You can actually only fast forward and move ahead to keyframes. Those little previews you see in the bar when you're moving your slider around, those are the different keyframes that you lock into. And it used to be that uh, video applications were typically a little more stingy with the keyframes and you would only get one like every 8 to 10 seconds. And so fast forwarding and rewinding was kind of a pain because it's hard to find like an exact moment if you wanted a specific second. But nowadays, typically every one or two seconds is normal. YouTube uses roughly every two seconds there will be a keyframe. Um, some ex some systems, some video codecs even vary the amount of keyframes depending on how much the video is changing. So like a video that you're seeing like of me now, right? My background is always constant pretty much, except when I put my hands here, then there's stuff moving in that region. So it's really easy to send deltas for this kind of video because the whole background is unchanging and only the pixels in this region here are actually updating. So you just have to send those updates for that region of pixels that's actually changing. And this is again the reason I mentioned snow earlier as an example of something that requires a lot more bandwidth. Um, this is also why snow typically looks bad and if you look at a video where there's a lot of snow on YouTube it comes out looking really bizarre because uh, when it's snowing the whole scene is changing. It's constantly in flux. There's white in one part on one frame and then white in another part on another frame as those snowflakes travel across the screen. So you're basically having to retransmit the state every time. So if you're using a delta system and it's snowing, then the deltas become almost as big as the keys because almost the entire image is changing when you're in snow or rain or something like that. And so for videos where the entire background is changing constantly, that's where you see the highest memory usage and that's where you see the the worst picture quality in general when you're looking at it on something like YouTube. This, by the way, wasn't a problem at all when we recorded things on film, right? Film doesn't have this concept of deltas. But if you think about how movies and film were distributed, they used to have a relatively low frame rate, frame rate and they would rely on a kind of motion blur effect in order to get you a clear picture. So if you paused films or, or tried to watch them more slowly, you'd see everything was kind of blurry. All right, and this was because it's really hard to take a lot of keys. That takes a lot of bandwidth, and it takes a lot of technology. And film, too. In film, every key had to be its own little slide of the film, right? And that means that if you're recording at 60 FPS, you're burning double the money, you need a better camera, you need better equipment and everything. So this is a problem that actually predates digital tech, although there isn't really a, like a delta equivalent in analog film. There is this kind of like motion blur effect that you can refer to to think about it conceptually. So if keys synchronize the content, deltas are used to update data quickly and save bandwidth, basically. So we, when we're watching YouTube, we're getting a keyframe every two seconds or so, but we're getting probably something like 50 deltas a second. It depends on the video. Uh, and it depends on, again, what's happening in the background and everything. But generally speaking, oh, and obviously your video settings, like what resolution you're watching it. But you're getting probably something on the order of 50 deltas a second, but only one keyframe every second or two. So in an application like Color Grid that's sending out 32 keys a second, that's really unusual. All right, so how do you send out your deltas? Do you send them out since the last key, or do you send them out since the last delta, like the example that I gave earlier? So the, the number was relative to the previous delta you received rather than the last key. So if we're using TCP, remember that everything is going to be guaranteed to be in order, but we don't necessarily use TCP. In fact, most voice over IP clients, like Discord, which we'll look at later, use UDP instead. Somebody asked if a marble just fell off my desk. Yes. 
Yes, it did. It's actually a little metal, um, I don't even know what you call it. It's a little metal two-way two gasket thing that I play with. But anyway, that that happened. Thank you for noticing. Good that my microphone picked that up, though. The, the joys of audio quality. So the latter is typically easier, the delta since last delta. So that's typically the more common approach. And the main reason that that's the more common approach is that if you are treating your deltas as the change since the last key, then when receiving a delta, you actually have to maintain two states. The application does. The application has to remember its current state, obviously, so that it can display it or do whatever with it. But then it also has to remember the state at the last key so that it can apply deltas to it. Whereas if you're doing the uh, change since last delta, you only need to remember your current state. And every time you get a delta, you just update your current state based on that. And this is typically how desyncs occur. Deltas arrive out of order, or they don't fail to arrive. This makes the current state corrupted, and that leads to a desynchronization eventually. And that's why we need keys to be sent out periodically, so that if a client desynchronizes, they pick it back up. And this will happen if you're watching like a live stream or something, and it drops out for like one second. Well, maybe yours, that one of the reasons that that might happen is because you desynchronized, you lost some deltas or something. And once you get the next key, your viewing of the stream picks up again. You start with new deltas there. So it is possible to do the former approach if you want it to be just slightly more robust, um, but typically you'll see the latter. Um, I don't know any implementation that uses the former. All right, so applying deltas to color grid, how can we do this? All right, well, the obvious choice is to update only the colors that have changed since the last key. This is what video does, this is what games would do, and if you haven't been paying attention, you've noticed, um, you should notice that color grid is essentially a video, right? The problem is that the server, which has this grid of colors, is trying to send it out to all of the clients. That is a video problem. And you can imagine that each of those little tiles that we're talking about are pixels. So color grid is 50 by 50 pixels big. Now your standard screen is at least 1080p, which is at least 1920 by 1080 pixels. And you're obviously looking at me sending you that. In addition to my slideshow, I've also got a camera going. Altogether, I'm sending you 1440p, which is like 2,400 by 1,400-ish pixels, and it's coming through fairly clear, and there are a lot of you on the receiving end. So how is it that uh, modern video applications are able to send hundreds of times more bandwidth than we're looking at in color grid, whereas we are struggling to send out that mere 50 by 50, that 2,500 pixels? Imagine a video in 4K, right, which is hundreds and thousands of pixels and it's still able to be transmitted. Um, look up the video rates for 2K, 1080p, and 4K, and you'll see that it's quite substantial, but it's nowhere near what we are trying to do uh, sending just this 50 by 50 grid in color grid. So we're actually using more bandwidth to send a little 50 by 50 grid than most real video applications are using to send a whole screen. And how do they do this? They send only the delta, as in the pixel that have changed since the last update, and they managed to do this with some very complicated math. But we're going to look at a simpler way to do it. So let's say, how might we send just the pixels that have updated? Okay, first, we can send the to the location. We can do this as x and y coordinates, or we can do it like we did in the previous example, where we just turn it into a one-dimensional array, and we just send 0 to 2,500. So everybody here should know how to turn a 2D array into a 1D array, and vice versa. A 2D array of uh, 50 by 50 is the same thing as a 1D array of 0 to 2500. It's just a conceptual thing for us, obviously. It's easier to work with a 2D array when we're talking about a 2D grid, but there's no difference between those things, right? It's easy to transform one into the other. So the first two bytes are going to be the location again, and then there's going to be three bytes of color, and we're only going to send the locations that have changed. So each one of these five byte pairs is going to be a location that's changed. That means how many of these can we fit into a TCP segment? Well, if it's uh, the standard 1460 payload in a TCP segment, and each of these updates of location cost you five bytes here, obviously, 
then we are just sending uh, 292 location updates in every TCP segment. That means that every 292 colored squares that get updated, we can send a delta. Now, how many colored squares get updated when you paint with a standard size zero brush? Well, at any given point, uh, I mean, unless you're moving your mouse at lightning speeds, which the application can't even handle on the sending end, uh, you're only talking about single digits of colors being updated. Now, if you switch to a size four brush, how big is that? Well, I don't know. I think it's probably no larger than 50, right? And um, again, if you move very quickly, you could probably get a few hundred to change in a second, but uh, we can send many, many deltas in a single second. So with this approach, we can send a delta every time 290 or so colors are updated, or we can just send a delta every so often, which is going to be the approach we'll have to take if we wanted to keep updating in real time. So we would do something like we'll send a delta every 1 16th or 1 32nd of a second, so we'll have a tick rate of 16 or 32 or something like that. And then at the end of every second, we'll send a key as well. And this would be a drastic reduction in bandwidth consumption. We would go from, in the best case, we were looking at something like 3,000 bytes for a key, which is at least two segments, really three segments. Okay, so we'd go from sending three segments 32 times a second to sending one segment 32 times a second, or 31 times a second, and then that big key update only once. So we'd have a reduction in bandwidth consumption of something like three times, just from using deltas instead here. And if there aren't the full uh, 292 changes to update, then the delta might actually be smaller than the full capacity of a TCP segment. So we're saving on a considerable amount of bandwidth there. So we might actually send, uh, let's say, only a few uh, things have changed, if only a few colors have changed, so we might send just uh, maybe a 200-byte payload or something, much smaller than the full capacity of the TCP segment. If you're really good at saving bandwidth, most of the implementations of voice over IP and video and stuff, if they don't get any traffic, they don't send anything at all, they just stay silent. Okay, so let's look at compressing the delta some more. Okay, we can also include the size information inside of our message and then allow the clients to process the size information on their end because it's pretty easy for the clients to get a location and then the color that it's supposed to be and then the size that the cursor is being drawn in. So the server gets this info. When clients draw on their screen, the server gets where they drew what color they were drawing in, and their cursor size. And in the current solution, in the current implementation, it's the server that decides what the screen is going to look like after that. Well, after the server figures it out, it can also allow the clients to simulate that on their own. So this is an example of letting the client do part of the simulation on their end. So this is offloading some of the work client-side. And this is a very dangerous thing to do in things like gaming, because the more you offload onto the client, the more you give clients the opportunity to cheat. But it's something that's very commonly done in things like video, where that's not a concern. And it's also very commonly done in gaming, because bandwidth requirements are tight, and it's sort of required. All right, so if we do this, if we allow the client to simulate cursor drawing on their end as well, then the server sends a 5-byte chunk still, as long as we use a little bit of bit magic in order to squeeze that size in. So remember, the size is only 0 to 4, which means we can easily pack it into just two bits, okay? And technically, remember, we didn't need the full two bytes for location. We just needed the first 12 bits for the location. So technically, we can pack in size into those remaining couple of bits in the two byte area we were using for the location. So this actually adds no additional bandwidth over the previous approach. So an example of what a message like this would look like is say that the user drew with a cursor a size 4 in cell 2300. We would send 2300, 4, and then in their colors, so in this case 255, 125, uh, 5.
Now drawing has to happen in order here, or we would get a desync. So the two things coming in different orders would give you vastly different results. So if you see somebody drawing in color one on cell 2300 and then in color two on 2301, well, you would obviously see most of those cells become the second color because the second color came in second. It overwrites the first one. Whereas if you got those out of order, you would see everything become the first color because it would have overwritten that second color. But even if this happens, these kinds of issues will be resolved when you get the key update at the end of the second. So even if these kinds of issues happen, they would go by so quickly that in most cases, the user probably wouldn't notice anyways. And that's usually what deltas rely on, is that if there are problems, then occasionally you'll see some sort of little static or an aberration, and then it will just get fixed. So you hope that there aren't any problems, but if you have a weird lossy connection or one that tends to have different spikes and latencies, so stuff sometimes arrives out of order, well, you can still make it work. A lot of implementations, uh, like I said, to save on bandwidth, if there is no change, will send a no delta message. So they'll have an additional sort of encoded uh, thing. They'll use uh, kind of like we had in the homework, we have basically a one byte header. If it starts with an A, it does this. If it starts with a C, it does this. If it starts with an S, it does this. That's a custom header that we've actually made there, right? It's the first character of the payload. Well, you might have another one of those uh, to indicate that there's a no change frame incoming. This tells the client that they're still connected and everything is good. There just hasn't been any change. And in that situation, you might reduce the tick rate to something much slower so that you're not sending as many packets through the network. We'll look at Discord in a bit. Discord does a one step up and even smarter example. We'll, pull, we'll look at Discord next time, obviously. It's pretty much out of time for today. In fact, I think this is a little bit complicated, so we're going to save it for next time. The client side prediction. All right, so I'll announce it one more time. If you're giving your homework a shot and you find that you can't compress all the way down to 3,000. Let's say you get to a higher number than that. Let me know. I have not decided yet if 3,000 is the best, most feasible requirement. I might drop it a bit. I know you can easily get to 7,500, so that's kind of the upper end requirement. Um, but if you're really struggling to get to 3,000 or below, let me know. The homework has a bonus if you use Delta. It's a pretty substantial bonus. So it's a little bit competitive. Whoever can get the bandwidth consumption down lowest gets the highest bonus. But everybody that makes a significant reduction will get at least a 10%. But the, the overall lowest bandwidth in the class is going to get a bonus of 25%. So a little bit of a competitive element there. See how low can you go. And obviously, it still has to feel like it's real time, just like my current implementation. If two machines are on it, it's still it's pretty snappy. It's pretty responsive if you're on a good network. Um, so you still have to maintain that, that real-time feel to be eligible. Uh, so make sure that in adding all these deltas and compressing it, you don't actually make it worse, basically. All right, that's all the time we have for today. And I will see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in.